I'm going to start a little bit early today, and you know, just a couple minutes here. But um, it looks like just about everybody's here. So um, today, I want to start to introduce uh, more about the adaptive components. So far, we've gone over the curtain panel pattern-based family, which was, you know, basically you make a element that was tied to a grid, and then it could repeat um, across the surface. This is a similar method of working, but it's actually in a different family type. And um, the adaptive component actually allows us to get a lot of different variation. Uh, so we can actually start to look at randomizing a panel and coming up with some uh, different designs than just having a, one element that constantly repeats all the way across the surface. And so what you're looking at here is kind of the goal for uh, perhaps today or the week. Um, there's going to be two different methods for randomizing a surface. One is going to be today is uh, going to focus on the point attractor method. And what that means is basically you can kind of see this here. There's a couple of purple points that are floating about this uh, particular surface. And if I were to... Uh, select one of these points. I'll try to tap through. There we go. And start to uh, manipulate where this point occurs in relationship to the panel. Um, these panels will update and change randomly to um, actually kind of open and close this oculus. You can kind of see right there that that panel started to shift and change based on the point attractors. For those of you that um, weren't here originally uh, when I made the announcement, today we're going to also need this file called Mullion Mass. This was a uh, file we started or actually made in, um, I think it was class 24. So if you don't have that with you, you can also just download it from the site. So let's go ahead and dive into this. Let me close out of all this. So you should have this one file open called Mullion Mass. And this is going to be an element that we're going to use to generate kind of the frame around this uh, particular component. And then we'll go over some methods of creating some, you know, making this component actually have a little more depth to it. Also going to open up, if we go to our user interface, the recent files page, go ahead and open up a new family. And we're going to be working within the file called, or the uh, template called generic model adaptive. This is another one of the components that are available in the conceptual design environment. You can usually tell when you're in the uh, massing mode because the screen always has this kind of gradient gray in the background. Normally when you get, go into the other files, you don't really see that in the 3D view. What did you call it? What you call it? Uh, generic model adaptive. So it should be down in the G's. All right, so the Generic or the generic model adaptive, it used to be called adaptive components in earlier versions, and they've changed it to that, that terminology. Um, but basically, you can see that we have the same set of uh, drawing tools that we've had in the curtain panel pattern based family, as well as the conceptual mass. And the most important part is we've got that point element uh, that we can um, utilize. Now, I'm going to go ahead and place, I'm in the uh, level one or the reference level floor plan, and I'm going to go ahead and place four points. And the order that I place these are actually uh, a little bit crucial. Uh, the first one's going to be up in this top left quadrant. Then I'm going to go over to the top right, bottom right, bottom left. And I'm actually going to make a fifth one that's going to be a little bit further down on the left. So it'll kind of look like if you were to connect all these dots, it'll look like a kite with a little string right there. So in the generic model adaptive, uh, family, essentially whenever you make these points, we can actually select all of these. So if you just window around them, and we get this other command that's only available in this particular file type, and it's called adaptive component make adaptive. We click on that, and basically what it does is it turns all of those points that we just placed into uh, a numbered point. You can see they're numbered in the order that we placed them. So one, two, three, four, and then five. And uh, basically, these are very similar to in the curtain panel pattern-based family that we explored before our rendering week. Um, essentially, remember that there were points on the grid intersection 
that was uh, these kind of blue points, and they were also numbered one, two, three, and four, if you remember from that, um, that template. Let's go ahead and I'll just open that up real quick. Uh, curtain panel pattern based. And so these were, um, they only showed the number once you selected them, but that one says number four and so on. So the, the difference between these two families is basically they are very similar into what they're going to do eventually. Uh, but basically the underlying template is that the adaptive component is a little more free form. It doesn't have to uh, um, rely on a grid that's already uh, down below it. Um, so that what happens is in this generic model adaptive family, you know, we can pretty much come up with any kind of shape or design that we uh, really want to go with. Um, what I'm going to do here is strike a couple dimensions here because I want to make sure we're kind of scaled correctly. So what I'm going to do is just make a couple dimensions from these points. And I'm snapping to the horizontal or the vertical line that's associated with the adaptive point. I'm not snapping to the point itself, but the actual plane. And that's important because that's going to move these points in the correct uh, dimensions. I'm just going to do the uh, top and the ones on the left and then we can use our align command later. The reason I want to do this is typically when we divide up a surface we're probably going to have a surface that has um, more dimensions that are more about maybe 10 foot by 10 foot in length and so I want to kind of model at least in the general scale of uh, how this will eventually be placed. So I'm going to pick this first point and in that dimension uh, let's type in 5 feet on both vertical and horizontal. I can do that on each of these. And then the ones that I didn't put a dimension to, we can just align using the point that's in place. And I'm just going to align each of these to essentially make a square. That's going to be 10 by 10. So I'm kind of trying to emulate or mimic the curtain panel pattern base family that has that underlying grid that was a 10 foot by 10 foot grid. The uh, fifth point you can leave kind of out there in space. It just needs to be somewhere off to the left. And now we can also delete these dimensions once we're done. I just wanted to kind of make sure we're all modeling in the same scale so that everything will look correct. Now that we've got all of those uh, numbered and they've turned into adaptive components, I want to select number one and two, and I'm going to do the spline through points command. Oops. Select both of these, spline through points. There we go. And when that line is created through those points, I'm going to also turn that into a, a reference line by clicking on that box called is reference line. And I'm going to do that with all of these, kind of connecting the dots here. And the reason I'm only selecting one at a time, or two at a time, is so that we just get a straight line and we don't try to get a, a spline that tries to arc and curve. So each time we want to make sure those are reference lines. And then four goes back to one to complete the square. And the last one is going to be four to five. We'll kind of create this kite tail. So we're kind of setting up the foundation for this uh, component that we can eventually um, you know, model to. We, we need these reference lines to always um, have things attached to so that wherever these points go, all of the solid geometry is going to move with it. Another thing I'm going to do is place another point, And I'm just going to place it uh, somewhere on the line that's between 4 and 3. And when I place it, I'm also going to turn on the uh, show reference planes where it says when selected. Go ahead and change that to always. Basically what that does is if we look at this in 3D, it gives us a plane that's perpendicular to that reference line that we can eventually apply a component to. You still have the uh, mullion mass loaded in your background. Switch to that. And if not, you can load it up. And then you want to load that into this particular project. It's going to try to place it somewhere. We don't need to place it at the moment. So I'm just going to hit Modify and then switch back into 3D. 
And this time I'm going to uh, hit Create, Component, and I want to be able to place this mullion on that plane. So if you recall from the previous week, if you go up to the Options menu, we want to choose the uh, placement plane and select Pick. And then we're going to hover over until we can pick that vertical plane that's perpendicular to that reference line. And then it's going to try to place this somewhere on that plane. I want to snap to the middle. Now, for some reason, uh, it's rotated, so I can just select that mullion profile and hit rotate. And I'm going to rotate it 90 degrees. So I have more of the uh, height is in the up-down direction instead of the horizontal. So we can select that uh, mullion profile. And one thing I want to do is, because these were modeled with model lines, which means because we brought it in from another uh, family, if we drew these as reference lines, we wouldn't see them. But because we drew them um, back in that other class as a model line, they actually show up. But what that also means is if you leave it on or leave it visible, uh, you'll see this every time this panel is placed, you'll see this actual you know, dark line that's associated with these um, mullion lines. So if you just select this and over here to the left where it says visible, just uncheck that box. It doesn't disappear in this environment, but it will once it's brought into a future, um, a future family. So now we can select the mullion, and I'm going to hold down the control key, and it should highlight your whole entire um, perimeter of that box. If it doesn't, you may have to tab over and select each one individually, but it looks like everyone was able to get that. And then you can just hit Create Form, Solid Form, and we get this strange, or at least I do, I get this strange option to make some kind of weird box or more of a tube frame. And I want to pick the one that's on the right to make that a frame. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and create a couple parameters. Uh, I want to be able to control the uh, width and the height of that profile for you know future reference. So I'm going to add a um, parameter here called Let's just call it frame. Actually, yeah, I guess let's just call it frame height. We'll make all of our parameters today an instance parameter because in order for these to eventually vary uh, when we place them somewhere, we want everything to uh, be an instance so that they can vary from panel to panel. So I've got frame height, and then my other one will be, um, let's say, frame width. <clears throat> hey, Jeremy. Yeah. Hey, mine's, mine's just making that weird box and not giving me an option to like that. Okay. Um, hit that escape key. Try it again. Pick the one off the far right. Maybe the uh, thumbnails might have been off screen or something. <clears throat> okay, and I'm going to set the uh, frame height. Let's make this something uh, fairly large, like 18 inches. And I'm going to do the frame width as, um, let's do about 6 inches. Now, in order for that to get applied to this, uh, this actual frame that we've placed, remember our mullion had some parameters that were already associated with it. So if you select your sketch or that initial profile, we can then hit Edit Type, and there is a W and a D dimension, um, and then we've got some buttons that we can actually assign to the new parameters that we've just set. So I'm going to do the D, I guess I should have named these similar, but that will be the frame height, and the W will be the uh, frame width. So there you go. Now we've got the ability to change the size of this frame just from this file with a set of parameters. Another thing I want to do is um, I'm going to eventually make a point in the middle and I want it to have some kind of inner thickness. So I'm kind of thinking that this frame is an outer uh, frame that at times will either be thicker than the interior or it could be um, you know, thinner. And I want to be able to control a point that's in the middle that can actually uh, 
you know, change the thickness of the interior. And so in order, for, in order to find that um, point in the middle, I just want to take, um, I'm going to turn on my wireframe. I'm going to choose point number three and point number one. And we can do a spline through those points, kind of making a diagrid and also choose that as a reference line. So we basically have kind of a hypotenuse going through that, that element. We can also place a point, and if we snap to the, you may have to rotate your view until you can get to it. Um, you should snap to the midpoint of that line. If you can't snap to the midpoint, but you can place it on a line, all you have to do is select that point and make sure your normalized curve parameter is set to 0.5 because that will be directly in the middle. Other thing that we'll do is when you click on that, uh, that point, show the reference planes. Let's change that to always. And there's another element here that we can choose called show normal reference planes. And if we uncheck that, it will actually show the rest of those other parts of the planes where we've got the horizontal plane and another vertical instead of just showing that perpendicular. Go ahead and save this while we're at it. Let's call this um, Adaptive Oculus Panel. Because we're going to have a void in the middle that will be a a circle oculus component. <clears throat> now while we're modeling in current panel pattern based families and also these adaptive component families, one thing you have to keep in mind is that everything always has to be snapped to or connected to these points or any of these reference lines that are associated with those points. So what that means is if I want to do something that's in 3D that is off of this point, I have to associate other points and other components to this particular reference plane so that anytime I move these points, see how when I move these up and down, everything should start moving with it. To make that happen, we can place a point, so I'm going to hit point, and before I place it on the screen, change the placement plane to pick, and I want to hover over and select that horizontal plane that was associated with that midpoint. If you're getting really thick lines, you may want to turn your thin lines on, which is turning off the line weights, but that little command up there will help. And I want to select that plane, and then I'm going to place a point off to the top, and I'll place another one off to the bottom. It remembers the last plane that you associated with, so you only have to select that once. By selecting that um, horizontal plane, what that does is now these points are going to be associated wherever this point is located and when I click on e either of these points, if I change the offset over to the left, so I'm going to do a positive offset of let's say 5 feet, that point should move up you know, in relationship to wherever that horizontal plane is. I'm also going to choose the other point Let's give that a negative offset of negative five feet. I'm going to select both of those points and also turn on those reference planes by doing the uh, show always. Kind of wish that was a default, but for some reason it is not. The other part that we need to do is align these points because we just kind of place them. Um, you know, haphazardly in there. I want to be able to align it to that center point. So by choosing the align command, if we select one of those vertical planes, you can select the corresponding vertical plane that's associated with that point. I don't think we need to lock it, but um, actually when I locked it before, it gave us some constraint error. So don't lock it for now. And then I want to select the other vertical plane and that should get this aligned so that point is directly above. And I want to do that on both sides or both points. You may have to tab over to select those individual planes. 
So when you look at it in plan, you know, basically you should just see all those points relatively on top of each other. I'm going to move, um, actually with my floor plan, since we're modeling things that are five feet up and so on, I'm going to select this reference level and I'm going to change my view range so that the top is unlimited, the bottom is unlimited, the level depth is unlimited, and my cut plane is up at 200 feet. This way I can see everything that we're, we have modeled. And it looks like, you know, my points are not on top of one another, and that's because, remember, I, I tweaked my particular points over here. So if I were to change this, get it closer to, yeah, closer to horizontal, that will put those right on top of one another. Yes, Monica? Did you uh, align both planes the, of each point? Both planes. Yeah, we you got to do the both. Of, both of the vertical planes will should get get it on top of one another. And I want to also test that this is working before I move on. So I'm going to select uh, point number two and point number three, and I'm going to use the move command. And let's move this out two feet. So I move that out, and it that center point, you know, because the hypotenuse changed and stretched, obviously our midpoint shifted to uh, be in the middle of that rectangle, and it looks like all of those points did move with it, so we've got that working well. Every time you get something working, it's good to hit save, because when things crash, you might have to do all these things again. What I would like to do is be able to eventually control the thickness of the interior. So basically, um, those offset commands, you know, so far we hard coded in a number of five feet, but we can associate that with a parameter. So if you select one of those points, the one that's up on top, and I'm going to select the button that's associated with offset, let's go ahead and add a parameter, and we'll call this, um, actually cancel out of that. Let's add the parameters over here and under the family types dialog box. So I want to be able to um, create a parameter here called inner thickness. I'm, I'm going to make that an instance. And then I'm going to have to add actually uh, two parameters. One is going to be called inner thickness positive or POS. And the other one I'm going to Control C that before I exit out of there. I'm going to add another parameter here called, so I do Control V and change POS to NEG for negative and also make that an instance. Just for my sake, I'm going to group both of those under constraints. And each of those are basically going to have a formula associated with it. The inner is going to be, or the positive one, will just be inner thickness divided by 2. And the other one, if I control C that formula, just select negative and then in parentheses. So now if we give this an inner thickness of, um, well, let's keep, kind of keep it where we are. Let's say uh, inner thickness will be instead of five, well, 10 feet, I guess we could do eight feet. So by ch choosing the inner thickness, that's basically going to mean that overall thickness between those two extreme points, uh, you should have a negative four and then a, four, a positive four. Now each of those points, the one that's up, you can go ahead and associate that one with inner thickness positive, and the other one should be the negative version. <clears throat> so basically what I want to do is I'm going to make a set of triangles that go from this frame to those points. I'm going to do that on both sides. 
And in order to do that, we actually, in order to make a, a particular triangular form or an or a actual um, flat plane, we do need to make reference lines that are associated, you know, that kind of frame out each of those components. So one thing that you've noticed is when you use the point command, you can host that on any kind of uh, reference line, but you can also host points on actual objects, which is actually kind of nice. So we can actually move a point and host it on the inner side of this frame. And I'm going to do that on the top and bottom. I'm basically making four points on kind of the uh, long, e each of the long legs of the rectangle. And I'm going to select each of those points and you can change that normalized curve parameter. If it's closer to zero, go ahead and type in zero. And on the other side, if it's closer to one, type in one. That will basically move that point to the corner of that, um, of that frame. So we can actually use these In this environment, you're always kind of um, using these points as a kind of like a connect the dots as you as you model. But these points are important because as your component shifts and changes, you need them to also move with the other elements in reference to one another. Uh, let's see. I'll go ahead and hit save. And then what we're going to do, and I'm just going to kind of go through this step by step. We're going to select each of these points, spline through points, turn it into a reference line. So you've got to make sure you're selecting that right point. And I do have to um, select the leg or the points that are down below, down below on the frame. Helps if you hold in control. You've got to use the tab command a lot, but I'm going to also do a spline through points on that and make a reference. By making that a complete triangle, I can select that as a triangle and do create form, solid form. And this time, instead of doing a solid, I'm just going to do a plane. So we actually need to do that on all of these sides, and then we're also going to do that down below. So I'm not going to really talk through that part, but you don't have to make another. Once you have a reference line there, you don't have to make another one. We can reuse it. If you're going to reuse the other one, you do have to control C and select it. So you're selecting all the individual parts again, do a solid form, and then we're going to make that a flat pa panel as well. I'm going to go ahead and pause the video so you guys don't have to watch an hour. The shortcut, since I'm having to tab over this like 20 million times, I'm going to select everything. And if you click on filter, check none, select other. And then I'm going to, I guess I didn't really have to do that, but I just want to hide, if you go ahead and hide the uh, frame, I guess I could have just selected the frame and hit hide, that would have been easier. This way we can get to those points a lot easier. There we go. And then when you're done, you can just, uh, we can unhide. So by making all those connections, and I'll, I'll, if you guys can keep on working to catch up, 
But by making all those connections, basically now if we change our overall inner thickness, so if I were to change this to 10 feet and hit apply, you know, all those components are going to stretch up and down with it. Or I could also make it smaller. So if my frame is 1 foot 6 inches and then I make this go down to 2 inches, then I kind of get it, um, you know, where it starts to slope towards the in inside, almost like a drain. Go ahead and make my frame height bigger, and everything should also stretch with it. Everyone got their form? <clears throat> if you can only complete, um, you know, at least a top half or a bottom half, if you're still kind of working on it, at least get a um, either a top or a bottom. That, that would work out pretty well. So what I'm going to do is select everything and choose filter. Choose select none and then select other. That'll make it where it selects all the, basically the uh, solid geometry. And I'm going to go ahead and hide all of that so all I see are my reference lines again. <clears throat> I'm going to make a set of dimensions that are basically going to help drive this randomized panel essentially in order to um, start to create things that can actually move in random when we're in this environment we actually need to obtain some kind of information from the surface that it is eventually going to be applied to and so what we need to do is actually make what are called um, reporting parameters and I want to be able to report eventually on what the length of this line between point 0.4 and 5 ultimately ends up being. And then I want to be able to measure what each of the legs are of the rectangle. So I just need you know one of the longer legs, one of the shorter legs, and then the hypotenuse. Where did my hypotenuse go? There it is. Yeah, this, no? This one, there we go. Got too many lines going on now. But I eventually want to be able to measure that line as well. In order to set up a reporting parameter, we need dimensions that are going to be tied to a specific reference plane and then are directly snapped to the actual individual dot that's associated with the endpoints. So to do that, if I select the dimension, the line dimension uh, tool icon. We can go ahead and hit under work plane, choose set, and where it says placement plane reference lines, we can go ahead and keep that there. Nope, wait. Set. That's not correct. Okay, so when, when you hit set and you hover over, that's not going to do it. There we go. When we hover over our lines, you should get this uh, rectangle that's kind of dashed, that's indicating it's selecting the horizontal, or it could be a vertical, it doesn't matter if it's horizontal or vertical, just as long as it's associated with that green reference line. And it looks like I was having a little bit of issues selecting that or finding that. And if you rotate your view a little bit, you might be able to um, get that to show up again.
I'm going to select that and then I'm going to snap to I'm going to have to tab over until I can select the point I need to be able to select the actual point that is number four guys select your point? Why is my computer messing up? I was able to select it for some reason in the plan view. That works. So I'm going to do that line, and then we need to um, do this again. Hopefully, my points will start co cooperating. I'm going to do the same set of dimensions, but each time we have to make sure we set the work plane associated with another, you know, the actual plane that we're going to be uh, dimensioning. So I'm going to do one of these long rectangular legs. I'm going to select the points. And if you don't select the points and accidentally select any of the parts of the reference plane, eventually the uh, reporting parameters aren't going to work out. So it looks like my view is starting to cooperate. For some reason, my view started uh, acting weird, and now it's working again. So that I want to make sure all of my dimensions are in the same view. So I deleted the one that was in that floor plan. So all we're doing there is setting up so that eventually we should be able to assign these dimensions to report whatever dimension it might be. Because when we apply this to a surface, in order to get this uh, point attractor method to work, uh, we basically want to be able to obtain uh, the information that's on each of these elements. And we're not going to know what the size of our panel is going to be because once we apply it to a surface, it could take on any shape and it could also be any size. So what I'm going to do is create a set of uh, reporting parameters. And I'm going to do this by clicking on Add. And I'm going to group all of these under Analysis Results. And I'm going to call the first one leg A. To make it a reporting parameter, we have to choose instance, and then you get the option to select reporting parameter down at the uh, that bottom checkbox. So we'll do another one here called leg B. Each of these need to be an instance and reporting. I'll do Another one here called, um, let's say, hypotenuse. What is that? Hypotenuse. There we go. <clears throat> and the other reporting parameter will be, let's call it PT attractor. Point attractor length. Dimension. 
So I've got it uh, under, that should all be under analysis results. So the reporting parameters, they look like the, the actual um, instance parameters, but instead of saying default, in parentheses, they'll actually say report, and they'll also be grayed out. We can't actually physically type in any information here because it needs to be obtained from some kind of geometry or those um, actual dimensions. So if we click OK, since we have that set up, go ahead and select the one that's associated with the tail, select that dimension, and we'll make that one equal to the point attractor length. The longer, well, I guess it really doesn't matter, but the uh, longer leg of the rectangle, I'll make that leg A. The other one will be leg B. And of course the hypotenuse will just be hypotenuse. If you ever get any kind of error messages um, ass assigning a reporting parameter in the methods that we just did, it's because you didn't snap to the actual point. So anytime I've done this before and you start to snap to other things other than the actual center of that point, uh, basically you'll get some kind of error message that says it has to be tied to a, a particular set of geometry. I'm going to go ahead and make our inner thickness, um, let's go ahead and make that a little more extreme again, like 10 feet. <clears throat> this center point that's in the middle, I want to also use that again to generate a void that's going to form an oculus circle. And so this is actually going to take a couple different steps because I've gotten it to work in mixed results, but um, we'll kind of work through it. I'm going to choose family types and let's make another uh, parameter here called void extrusion. We'll make that a, well since everything's an instance parameter, we'll make that an instance. I'm going to group that under constraints. I'm going to give that a formula that is going to be inner thickness. Let's go ahead and do times 10 to ensure that our void eventually you know, goes all the way out. Actually, that's probably a little too far, maybe times 5. In order for the void to actually cut anything, we definitely need to make sure it, you know, uh, the form passes through the solid geometry. I'm going to choose circle, and I'm also going to place this by doing a placement plane and selecting pick. And I want to select that horizontal portion of that midpoint. And then I'm going to snap to the center and just draw a circle, fairly large. And while you're are at that point of drawing the circle. If you just finished it, you can hit that um, little dimension icon to turn that temporary dimension into a actual dimension. If you've already exited out, you could always click on that point or click on the circle again, and that would allow you to get that icon. We're also going to turn that into a reference line so that we can use it over and over again. <coughs> the circle. So when you select it, go ahead and make sure it says is reference line is checked. I'm going to go ahead and choose create form, solid form or void form, and I'm going to choose the one that is on the left that looks like it's moving in 3D. And I'm going to change this to have a positive, actually we can do positive negative can be equal to the void extrusion. Now if I go back and look at my form, like turning on basically everything that was hidden, I've just placed that void, that actual void form and nothing is actually getting cut. So the, let's see if I can do a shortcut here. I'm going to tab over and select 
all of these faces of the triangle or this pyramid that's up at the top. Let me see if I can hit join. Nope. So unfortunately this is the part that I ran into when I was working on this. Because I made each of these triangles a separate plane, in order for the void to cut, I have to choose the cut command that's up here at the under modify where it says cut. I'm going to choose a triangle and it, I can only choose one surface at a time and then I can choose that void. And it takes away my void form when I'm done. So what I have to continue to do is use that reference plane or that reference circle that's in the middle and kind of repeat these steps a couple times. So I could really just, since I'm working on the top, make the uh, positive offset, the void extrusion. And I'm going to use cut. I'm just going to go around so I can keep cutting and eventually get a circle out of this uh, component. Go ahead and uh, I'm going to do that on the top and I'm also going to do that on the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the video so I don't have to waste a lot of time. If anyone ever discovers a way to automate that better, I would like to know. I've been uh, playing around with other methods and haven't ever really discovered one. So. Half of mine, when I first made them, like half of them cut, like the bottom half, uh -huh. half came out and the top did it. Yeah, I've done this uh, actually three times now, and the first time I did it, both voids cut, and I was like, wow, that was great, and then I did it again, and I had mixed results, like half and half, and it seems like this third time, none of them work, so I'm not sure what determines the, uh, the method to that madness. But the last part of this is that um, since we've cut a circle or a void circle that's going through that center, I also want to make this appear solid. So right now, you know, we've got these open edges that are at each part of the triangle. So we can tab over until you can select the edge of each of those parts of the void. And I'm just going to be able to do the bottom and top that are associated to one another. And you can choose create form, solid form to sort of close this off. Uh-huh. So, so if I do a, that's nice. So if I made that and select. Oh yeah. Uh huh. And then I can go around and. So that's good. That's good. I would have saved some time. Always forget to look in these little uh, bars up here, the little options bar. There's always some, some little checkbox you can pick. But yeah, so if you pick that, it sounds like we can um, select that void and then select all the faces and get that all in one swoop. The um, last part is I'm going to continue. closing off that interior. Basically after closing off the interior, and it doesn't always do a pretty job. Man, I have all kinds of problems. Basically after closing off this interior, uh, that, that'll be essentially it for this component, but then we're going to work on how to control it so we can get our varying forms <clears throat> when it's applied to a surface.
One thing I eventually want to do is be able to change the materiality of these solid panels. So if the first thing is if you select the frame where it says material, go ahead and click on that button that's associated or at the far right. And we're going to add a parameter and let's call that frame material. You can keep that as a type for now. The reason it's going to be a type is that um, when I change the material, I want all of them to change at once. If you wanted to alternate, you know, materials like we talked about with the die grid, you know, you could change it as an instance and then individually select certain components, <clears throat> and you could change, you know, ma the materials that way as well. While that's still selected, I'm going to hide that frame. Then I'm going to select everything that's remaining, choose my filter, check none, and then select other. <clears throat> Check none mass. All right, why, where are my triangles at? What is that? Well, it should have selected all of these faces, but I'm going <clears> to... <throat> I'm going to make those equal to a material parameter called... Let's just call that panel material. This way we can change the frame and also the actual panel. Just keep that as the, um, the <clears throat> I actually want to do all of these components. Then we can go ahead and make it so we can see everything again. <clears throat> so I'm going to make a parameter here called void r because I want to be able to control the size of this oculus. So if we type in uh, void r, and I'll keep that under <clears throat> dimensions for now. That'll also be an instance. Let's go ahead and set that dimension that was inside that radius. Go ahead and change that and make that equal to void R. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and hit save. Now before we actually make this where we can control it and randomize it a little bit, let's talk about how to actually use these adaptive components and how we apply them to a particular surface. Now remember we've got five points and we placed them in a particular order. The order that we place these are going to be very important. Just remember we did a left top, right top, bottom right, bottom left, and then we have some tail that's off in the distance. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and open up a new file, just the new conceptual mass, and select mass and open. <clears throat> In the floor plan view of the uh, conceptual mass, I'm going to use the uh, arc, the start end radius arc command. And I'm going to make a arc that goes up to the top. And I'll make another one that's connected, kind of like a little S curve. When we look at that in 3D. We can go ahead and select that curve, choose create form, solid form. we get this surface. <clears throat> I eventually want to get um, different types of randomization al along this particular surface. And so what I'm going to do is select the surface 
and I can add edges and profiles. And what that will do is start to split this surface into different parts and pieces. So I'm going to add a profile. I'm going to do one that's kind of in the middle. You can see how I hover over the vertical portion of that. And you should get a uh, ghosted curve that's showing up. And when I left click, that will place that panel. And what that means is now when I tab over, you can see how I, I've got this wireframe that's kind of split that into, it'll eventually be split into different uh, faces. I'm going to add a uh, edge by hovering over the kind of the center. I'm just going to kind of move along and get maybe two, two additional edges on either portion of this. So when I tab over and select that, I've kind of got this divided up in the manner you see on the screen. <clears throat> now I'm going to choose Divide Surface. You're going to see I'm going to get a lot of different you know, panels along here. Looks like, looks like my middle profile didn't really do anything. Well, now that we've got that set up, I'm going to go ahead and um, change. I'm going to select one of these, which I can select all of them. And I'm going to change the U grid layout. Let's choose something smaller, like four. And then I'm going to choose the V grid. Let's change that to six. Maybe uh, five. Basically, by doing that, I get these um, panels to be a little more rectangular instead of and a little bit larger. <clears throat> so if you remember from the last time that we did something similar where we worked out our um, curtain panels and we applied it to this grid, if you remember when you select the um, actual grid, we could choose from our patterns to the left and we could kind of scroll down and try to find our component. Let's go ahead and load this Oculus into the project, family three, at least in my case. And it's going to try to place that component somewhere. I'm just going to go into a 3D view and hit modify just to kind of escape out of that command. If I select this grid again and I try to look for it over here to the left, You'll notice I don't see that particular pattern in that menu that's off to the left. That menu that's off to the left is only associated with anything that's modeled in a curtain panel pattern-based family. So with the adaptive component, we actually need to place it on this surface. It looks like this last one I'm going to change the... Uh, And in order to place this on the surface, I actually need to change, I think I'm going to have to do this individually. I'm going to select one of the surfaces, or the divided surface, and up at the top here where it says surface representation, there's a little down arrow off to the right. When you select that, under surface, we can turn on the nodes of that particular grid. I mean, actually, looks like I can't do it when I select multiple surfaces, so I'm going to And by turning on the nodes, what that will give us an opportunity to actually be able to snap to different corners of the surface or of the divided grid. So once I've done that, I now need my fifth element, basically. If you remember, our component had four points. It's going to snap to four components or four points of this grid, and then eventually it needs to snap to a point attractor, and that's what that little kite tail is going to be. So if I look at it, this in floor plan, I'm just going to go ahead and place 
couple points here. Let's see, I'm trying to think of how many surfaces I ended up with. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six. So you want to place an attractor for each divided surface you have, and for some reason my middle division never occurred. It occurred last time I did this, but I'm just going to move on. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, and then I need a sixth point here. I'm going to go ahead and select all of those points. Let's change the offset of those points. I'm going to kind of move them up maybe 30 feet just so they look like they're about centered on my particular object or my surface. <clears throat> now here comes the fun part. I know this took a lot of steps to set this up, but the one thing to note is, remember, you're just modeling this one little component that eventually gets randomized or repeated over a surface. And if you had to do this in Grasshopper, which most people who are doing these type of surfaces, you'd have to come up with a pretty elaborate script in order to make that work and then make it apply to your uh, particular surface. Also, if you were doing this in Rhino, let's just say you were modeling it, of course you'd have to model you know, each of these components and you know, physically make the changes as you decide to change things from time to time. <clears throat> Another nice thing about this um, particular component, this adaptive com component that we're going to place, is something that's new in, I think it came out in Revit 2013. Um, so if you've done this on, I've actually done this before on Revit 2012 and, and previous to that, and it was a lot more tedious of a task. I'm going to go over a couple new commands here. If we go to create, I'm going to place a component. I should be able to find my adaptive Oculus panel should be highlighted. And it wants you to place this by the particular order that you actually made your element. So remember that order, the one, two, three, four, and then the five. I'm just going to pick the top left of one of these grids. I'm going to make sure I'm snapping to the node point. I'm going to go to the top right. I'm going to go down to the bottom right and the bottom left. And then my last component needs to touch one of those point attractors. So in doing that, you should have your component placed on that wireframe grid. <clears throat> I'm, go ahead, I'm going to do a save right here. And let's save this as, um, let's just call this Oculus sur uh, Surface. Now prior to Revit 2013, you had to do that every single time you wanted to place that component. So I would have to keep going and doing that every single time. Luckily, they developed a new array command that if we select this component that, it's, that is placed, look up at the top here where it says repeat. It looks like the array command, but it has a P, a little lowercase p off to the bottom right. Go ahead and click on that. And what that's going to do is kind of remember the clicks that you made and then it's going to array it across that particular divided surface and it's always going to attach the tail to that point attractor. So if you kind of tab over you know, each of these ele elements you can kind of see <clears throat> if I s select that point attractor it should select all those components. So I'm going to do that because, because I divided this surface up into multiple gridded elements I do have to place at least one on each of the grids and make it connect to another point attractor and then use the repeat command. If I had only had one point attractor and I did it all across the surface and I only had one surface, this would obviously repeat all the way across. So again, if you missed that, I'm going to go back to the component and I'm going to always place this in that same order. 
And this time I'm going to go to a different point attractor. We can hit repeat. Now what's nice about the repeat command is if I were to select my this gridded surface that was associated with that at least one of these Let's see if I can get in there let's say I choose to add or subtract more grids in that surface so let's say I choose um, Let's do eight down here, so I'll add more divisions to that particular element. As I add more, because I use the repeat command, it knows that if there's going to be more grids associated with that element, or if I were to stretch this grid up, you know, let's say I take this surface and change it to, you know, another height, it's going to continue to repeat that element over and over again. So I can keep playing with the grid and how it's divided and then um, you know sort of get different results playing around with that that division so I'm going to go ahead and place these So basically, uh, for today's class, I wanted us to get this far. Um, essentially, we can also select, if you were to select one of these elements and click on Edit Type. Um, I'm supposed to be able to... You should be able to select your component and click on edit type and our materials would be available. For some reason that's not working, so. Um, you need to change the family to adaptive Oculus panel when you hit edit type. Yeah, for some reason it says repeated component, default component. Yeah, and you go to edit type. So I'm going to actually, um, in order to do that, we need to we need to tab over that and right click and say select all instances and entire project and change this to our adaptive oculus panel I hadn't seen that before what happened? so now I got those now I have those parameters where I've got the uh, ma panel material and the frame material and so just like in the other classes, you can go back and you know, add your uh, different materials and um, kind of start to get this to look more than just a, a gray object. What we'll do on um, Thursday is we're going to continue using this panel. So if you didn't complete it, please complete it by next class. Uh, get it to where it's set up with all those same parameters that we already have. Essentially what we've done so far is laid the kind of the framework down so that we have a point attractor that's associated with a set of panels. Right now when you move that point attractor, nothing happens. So we need to associate a couple more formulas and computational um, elements 
to that uh, particular panel to program it so that it will actually change in values as we um, kind of mo move these point attractors closer or further away from the component. Also on Thursday, we're going to go over a method, another method for randomizing uh, that it will still use this panel, but we'll kind of modify it so that we can use it on a, a gridded surface and kind of morph it into um, another, it's something that's other than these perfect rectangular um, you know, div divisions across the surface. One thing to note is, you know, everything I've done so far has always been with a grid. You know, it's just a rectangle. If you remember, all of our grids or our divided surfaces can actually have all of these additional types of patterns. So this one-third step or half step, it still forms a rectangle. So I could also use that as a, a, a pattern generator. So I might actually experiment with that um, between uh, now and Thursday. But if you were to do the hexagon or an octagon rotate or any of these other uh, panels that you, or these other grid, gridded options that you see here, one thing to note is that when you turn on the nodes, obviously if you do the hexagon or the octagon, you're gonna have more points that are associated with the node. Therefore, your node or your actual adaptive points that you make for your particular element have to match the grid that you're eventually going to use. So if you're going to end up with eight points, then you need to have adaptive, you need to have eight adaptive points. And if you're doing the point attractive method, you know, you have to have the ninth point that's going to be off into space. So just keep that in mind a little bit. You have to do, you do have to plan ahead before you make your component, you know, exactly what type of grid you want to experiment with. So I'm going to leave it at that. Um, obviously, no homework unless you haven't finished your grid, and then we'll uh, continue on on Thursday. I'll stay for any questions afterwards. Thank you.